Hey, what's up YouTube? What's going on? Thought I would just do a continuation from one of my previous videos in which I talked about the return to play after sustaining a lumbar disc herniation in NHL players. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about the return to play after sustaining a lumbar disc herniation in NBA players. So for those of you guys that follow me along this channel, you know that I love talking about lower back pain, specifically herniated disc injuries, but I also love talking about basketball and hockey just because I've spent time working in the NBA, but also being a former hockey player myself and having trained professional hockey players as well. So without further ado, we'll just jump into this research study, which is titled Outcomes After Lumbar Disc Herniation in the National Basketball Association. The study is done by Minhas and colleagues, and was published in 2015. And so the whole purpose of the research study was to look at the return to play of NBA players who sustain a lumbar disc herniation and if they were able to return to play. So the study collected data from the 1984 to 85 season to the 2013 to 2014 season. And there was data collected among 61 NBA players and 34 had undergone surgery, a disectomy, and 27 underwent conservative treatment. So 48 were able to successfully return to the NBA to some extent, and 13 were not able to return to play at all after sustaining a lumbar disc herniation. So the percentages there are pretty high in terms of the amount of players that were able to return. But to move forward with this, and what is very interesting is that there was a significant negative correlation between the position of center and the height of basketball players and their ability to return to play. So basketball players that were taller than 83 inches or equivalent to six foot nine were less likely to return to play after sustaining a lumbar disc herniation. So taller athletes, less likely to return to play. Now, you could speculate as to reasons why for this. The thing is with taller athletes, especially NBA players who are six nine or taller, they have much longer levers. So they, they have to travel through greater ranges of motion when they may bend over to pick up things, much more stress on the lower back. At the same time, things aren't ergonomically designed for them being so tall. And in society, not many things are designed for people who are taller than six foot nine. So there's probably a lot of complications with, the, with in terms of the recovery process and treatment process with a lot of these taller athletes, and it's much harder to get them back and to help educate them or even maybe teach them to maintain good posture. A lot more complications involved with these taller athletes. Also of interest too was that the surgical group that underwent a disectomy, upon their return to the NBA, uh, these individuals within their first season, they had a significant drop in their performance and games played upon when compared to a control group. Now, their performance during their second and third seasons was not significantly less when compared to controls. So it kind of leveled off after the second and third season. And that could be maybe just due to complication with the surgery, a little bit harder to get back. They may be rusty upon returning to their first season. Uh, a bunch of different factors to, to speculate, but hard to really specifically say, but that was kind of interesting to see. And the conservative group, they did not see any significant drop in performance or games played upon their return to the NBA in their first season, second season or third season, which is different from the surgical group. Now, there wasn't any significant differences between groups, but that's interesting to see. And maybe the conservative treatment group, just because they didn't undergo the surgery, they were able to maybe, they didn't have to go undergo complications with the recovery of the disectomy being invasive and whatnot. So could be some complications there or whatnot. So overall though, with regards to the study, NBA players, for the most part, a lot of these individuals were able to return to the NBA and sustain their performance. And they didn't really have a significant drop in games played or performance. But the, the one thing I want to touch on with regards to NBA players, and I have firsthand experience training these guys, is that you could really screw up a NBA player's back very quickly if you are not careful or cautious with the exercises or programs that you're prescribing to them. If you're prescribing high volume sit-ups, or if you're not monitoring technique during a deadlift or squat and they're doing a pull or squat or deadlift under load, you could significantly screw their low back up in an instant and then end their career. And 
I am fortunate enough to have a first-hand experience to actually work with these guys. I know how they move, and they do have a lot of mechanical, structural abnormalities. So you have to be really cautious and careful with these individuals when you're prescribing exercise to them, because you don't want to be putting them in positions where you're going to be causing something like a disc herniation or disc bulge to occur. And one thing I just want to mention is that a lot of individuals have bulging or herniated discs, but they just don't know it and they're asymptomatic. But the thing is, is that while a lot of these individuals may have asymptomatic disc bulges or herniations, if you go prescribe the wrong exercises, you can then accelerate that damage that has already occurred and then maybe get, to them, get them to that position where now that disc bulge or herniation that wasn't causing pain is causing pain. So that's why it's very important as a trainer or a coach or maybe even a fitness enthusiast to really be careful with the exercises they're doing with either themselves or the athletes or individuals that they're training. You don't want to be putting individuals into a position where you're going to be increasing the risk of injury. Rather, the whole point and whole goal is to reduce the risk of injury while maintaining and improving performance. Now, there's a lot of risk reward associated with a lot of injuries, but we want to minimize the risk and maximize re the reward. So when it comes to something like a sit-up for a basketball athlete, sure, it's going to develop their abdominals and make their abdominals stronger, but it comes at a significant risk where we can be inducing a disc herniation. So as you can see, the risk outweighs the reward. So that's one thing to consider when prescribing exercise. What is the risk reward ratio? And that's it for this video, guys. Just wanted to touch on NBA players and their return to play in the NBA after sustaining a lumbar disc herniation. I know I talked about hockey players. Thought I would talk about basketball players now and just to give you guys some insight on what the return to play is and these athletes themselves. Okay, guys, if you have any questions, comments, if you have any topic that you want me to cover, please leave a comment below. And also, with that being said, we'll just wrap it up for this video. And until next time, all the best, guys, and take care.